without further ado, I'm going to uh, invite uh, our next speaker, to, our first speaker to come up, Steve Churchill from Duke University, who's going to talk about pelvic architecture of Australopithecus sediba and Genus Homo. Thank you, Chris. Um, so as the co-chair of, um, of the symposium, I also want to extend a welcome to you. I think we're going to have a fantastic uh, afternoon of, of talks. Uh, I want to kick things off by talking about pelvic architecture. And if you look at the last four and a half million years of the evolution of the human pelvis, I think all paleoanthropologists would, re would agree that you see some major architect architectural changes here which reflect uh, an improvement uh, in the ability of this structure to engage in bipedal locomotion. So, you know, most notably, the pelvis gets shorter from top to bottom. The iliac blades or hip blades become uh, more flaring and more lateral. So everybody would agree this is probably about bipedalism, but that's really where the, um, the agreement ends. And when you get down to the differences between the Australopiths, like Lucy as a group, here's a reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis, and members of the genus Homo, whether it's early Homo, like Homo erectus, or later Homo, like us, there are some major structural changes here, and there's not very much agreement about what those changes mean. So for instance, in the, the pelvis of the genus Homo, you find that the hip blades are more vertically oriented, they're, they're more uh, curved, the birth canal is rounder and larger, the uh, pelvis itself is, is more robust, it's stouter, the, um, the pubic bones are more upturned, the, the ischium in the back of the pelvis is shorter. So what do these, these differences between Australopithecus and the genus Homo mean? Well. Um, uh, Chris talked about the fact that there are sort of two major views of, of locomotion in the Australopiths, and depending on which of those two views you subscribe to depends on how you interpret these changes in the pelvis from the Australopiths to the genus Homo. So by one model, which we might call the arboreal model, um, the Australopiths were, for sure they were bipeds when they were on the ground, but the argument is that they didn't spend all of their time on the ground that uh, they were still climbing trees, maybe to get away from carnivores. Uh, this guy looks like he's not doing too good a job of that, but uh, to get away from carnivores, or they're sleeping up in the trees, or they're going up there after food resources, and they're feeding up there, or whatever. But for some reason, it's important to their adaptation that they're still climbing. And because they're still climbing, they're, they're spending some of their time on the ground, some of their time on the trees, they've got to have a locomotor skeleton which is competent in both of those things. And therefore, there have to be compromises that are made. Um, so according to this model, Lucy and other Australopiths, um, basically, selection was constrained to the extent to which it could, could improve their skeleton for bipedalism, because they had to be competent climbers. And because of this, it's been suggested that when they did walk terrestrially, they walked with a different kinematic gait that they probably walked more like a chimpanzee walks bipedally with a flexed, uh, a partially flexed hip and a flexed knee. So the argument goes that with the origins of the genus Homo, like this early um, Homo erectus skeleton from Africa, that uh, the genus Homo is fully terrestrial. And now this constraint is lifted, and now selection really can fine tune the skeleton for bipedal locomotion. We get changes in the pelvis and other changes in the lower limb, and our kind of bipedalism, full striding bipedalism on an extended hip and an extended knee comes about. So by this model, that would explain the differences in the pelvis between these two groups. And then, as Chris said, there's also some scientists who think, no, Lucy was a dedicated terrestrial biped. The amount of time that she spent in the trees was minimal. And um, uh, in fact, the adaptations of her lower limb for bipedal locomotion kind of ruined her for climbing. Uh, the, the, the changes down here made her an incompetent climber, and so we're looking at a fully terrestrial animal here. So then the question becomes, well, why does the hip change? Uh, and in fact, it's been suggested that Lucy was not only a good biped, but she was a better biped than us, that her pelvis is better adapted for bipedalism than ours. And that should always sort of raise a question for people, because why should selection ever uh, favor the worsening of a structure for the job that it's intended to do? Well, the argument goes that the, the differences between 
the, the pelvis of these australopiths in our pelvis has not to do with locomotor changes, but with the fact that brains got big in the genus Homo. And we have to pass, I say we, but fortunately I don't actually have to do this, um, but some of us in here have, have done this, um, have got to pass a large brain baby through this bony, bony birth canal. And so um, in order to accomplish that, as brains expanded in the genus Homo, the hip blades had to be moved, or the uh, hip joints had to be moved farther and farther apart, and there was some sort of constraint operating on the total width of the pelvis, and so that requires an architectural change overall in the pelvis. So um, according to Owen Lovejoy, who's the major proponent of this model, um, the differences in the pelvis between Australopithecus and the genus Homo aren't about locomotion, they're about big brain babies and the architectural changes that you need to accomplish that. In a couple of papers, Lovejoy actually laid out a model explaining how these changes came about, and he basically said there are three large-scale architectural changes that occurred going from Australopithecus to the genus Homo. The first is that the birth canal got rounder, the second is that it got larger, uh, and the third is that uh, there was an upward rotation of the pubis in the front of the pelvis, a downward rotation of the ischium in the back of the pelvis in order to increase space in the birth canal. And then he said that because of the way that the pelvis develops, to, um, to, to get these kinds of architectural changes, you're going to get some secondary changes. Uh, the, the, the pubic ramus in fr front becomes shorter. Um, the iliac blades have got to become more vertical and less laterally flared. Uh, these features called iliac pillars sort of change position and become more robust. I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, the, the ilium itself, the upper part of the pelvis becomes more robust and the ischium shortens. All as developmental consequences of these major um, architectural changes. Well, we have some new specimens from South Africa which shed a little bit of light on this question of was it a locomotor shift or was it some sort of um, obstetric shift that explains the differences in the pelvis of these two groups. Um, this is a new species of Australopithecus, Australopithecus sediba, from a site uh, called Malapa outside of Johannesburg. We have two partial skeletons. Uh, this is MH1. He's a subadult male. He's the type specimen of the, the species. And this is MH2, an adult female. She's the paratype. And they're about 1.98 million years old, which is a really interesting time because that's around the time that the last Australopiths are disappearing from the fossil record and early members of the genus Homo are starting to become more abundant uh, in the fossil record. And as you can see, we've got some um, pelvic remains from both of these individuals represented. Uh, when we announced the species a year ago, all we had were portions of the juvenile male pelvis. We had the left hip blade and ischium, and we had a portion of the right hip blade. But even with those parts, we could tell that there were a number of derived features, of homo-like features in the pelvis that were more similar to what we saw in things like Homo erectus than they were to what we saw in other Australopiths, like Lucy or like STS-14, which represents Australopithecus africanus from South Africa. So uh, we're, we're starting to see some of these features and some of the things that Lovejoy had argued were a function of large brains in this Australopith, but what's interesting is this is a small brain species. The juvenile male has a, a brain size of about 420 cubic centimeters. He's almost adult, so if the brain were to get bigger, it wouldn't get much bigger. Um, and that's on the low end of the range for Australopiths. So we're seeing these changes before brain size expansion, and that suggested to us that there was something wrong with the obstetric model. Um, now you can say, well, uh, this is a juvenile male. It's a male, it's a juvenile. What would an adult female look like? Well, about a month after we announced the species, we began to recover parts of the, the female's pelvis. We actually had the pubis at the time that we announced the, the species, but we found uh, uh, her hip, uh, the upper part of her hip blade, the ilium, and we found her sacrum, and uh, that allowed us to reconstruct half of her pelvis, which we could then mirror image. Now, there is, unfortunately, the anterior part of the hip blade is missing, uh, and that required a little bit of interpretation, but we had some nice curvatures there that we could work with to kind of guide um, the reconstruction.
And uh, here's her reconstructed uh, pelvis mirror image. This is a virtual reconstruction of the South African uh, STS-14 Australopith specimen. And here's MH1, the juvenile male. We, we reconstructed him too, although we have a lot less to work with, and so we're not as confident in the reconstruction of him. But you can see that there are some real architectural differences here. Um, between Sediba and Australopithecus africanus. Uh, the same would be true if I put Lucy's pelvis up there. Um, and again, this is a small-brained species. So here's a chart with some of the obstetric um, uh, diameters and other diameters. Uh, this column is uh, MH2 from Malapa. This is uh, that Africana specimen, STS-14. Here's a reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis. And this is a specimen from Gona, Ethiopia, which has been um, attributed to Homo erectus, but its, it's taxonomic placement isn't 100% certain. And I just want to point out two things. The first is if we take the ratio of the width across the hip blades relative to the width between the, the hip joints, uh, this small number in Sediba relative to the Australopithecus and relative even to Gona um, is an indication of how vertically set those hip, hip blades are. And the second thing is, uh, Highlighted in yellow here is just the ratio between the diameters of the, the pelvic inlet in two directions. And um, this, this number here tells you, relative to Lucy, that this is a rounder um, birth canal um, than we find in Lucy. Lucy's is very uh, oval and long from side to side. But the same is true of, of this Africana specimen from East Africa. And this isn't as round as you get in later Homo, but it is certainly a rounder. Um, birth canal. Now, this is a, uh, the iliac angle, which is the measure uh, between the, the um, pubic ramus here and the front of the iliac blade here. And you can see in the genus Homo that the angle tends to be uh, relatively small, both because the pubic symphysis is superiorly oriented and because the iliac blades are fairly vertical. When you get to the Australopithecus, here's Lucy and here's STS-14, that angle tends to be fairly open because the pubic rami are horizontal and the iliac blades are more flaring. Here's MH2. This is a, a Neanderthal, uh, which is like other Homo. And you can see that MH2 has got uh, an iliac angle, which is lower than what we're seeing in, in the Australopithecus. And it's still high for what we tend to see in, in modern humans, but certainly within the range of variation of modern humans. Uh, I mentioned that iliac pillar. Um, in MH1, we see a very Homo-like iliac pillar, at least in some respects. It's a very distinct iliac pillar. Uh, whereas in MH2, it looks much more like the Australopith condition. It's an indistinct pillar, seems to be very anteriorly positioned. So there's some variation here, where one of them looks a bit more homo-like, the other looks very primitive, very Australopith-like. So we're not entirely sure what's going on with that. And then I also mentioned that um, uh, one of the things, the secondary changes, is an increase in the robusticity of the, the pelvis. Uh, and this is just a measure of the stoutness of this area right here where loads are transferred from the sacroiliac joint to the hip joint. And um, uh, what you can see is that members of the genus Homo, whether they're modern humans or archaic humans like Homo erectus and Neanderthals, uh, tend to have a very thick, very robust um, area here. You can tell also that this area is shortened relative to what you see in Lucy, and this is despite the fact that MH1 is a little bit larger in body size than, than Lucy. Um, Australopiths tend to have a very, very thin and elongated area there, a very sort of gracile um, area, and again, both of our, our hominins from Malapa fall with the modern humans rather than, or with uh, the genus Homo, rather than with the Australopiths. And then the last feature that I'm going to talk about is um, uh, this little uh, groove or sulcus right here between the hip joint and the, um, the ischial tuberosity. In the genus Homo, it tends to be a very narrow groove. So what we've done here is we've simply divided it by the diameter of the hip joint to control for body size. 
And you can see in modern humans and archaic humans that um, it tends to be a very, very narrow groove relative to body size. In the Australopiths, it tends to be a very large, uh, long groove. And that's a reflection of the, the reduction in the size of the ischium, the lower part of the pelvis in the genus Homo. And again, the, uh, our single specimen, MH1 from Malapa, we can evaluate this in. Again, it looks like Homo rather than like Australopithecus. And this is just to illustrate this feature. Here are two specimens of um, Australopithecus afarensis from Hadar, and you can see this, this uh, sort of great distance here between the hip joint and the ischial tuberosity. And here's MH1. These have all been scaled to the same size. And here's MH1 to show you how much narrower this, this groove is. Now again, you can say, well, he's a juvenile. And who knows, maybe with a, a, a couple additional years of growth, the ischium would really, really grow and this sulcus would become a lot larger. Well, in response to that, I can show you a juvenile Australopithecus africanus specimen from Makapanzgat, MLD8. This individual is of a much younger developmental age than MH1. And the groove, so here's the bottom of the acetabulum here, and here's the top of the ischium here. This, uh, this sulcus is actually already absolutely larger than it is in, in MH1. So I don't think this is a developmental thing. I think the ischium really is shorter in MH1. So going back to these things which are argued to be about brain size expansion, um, in Australopithecus sediba, we are seeing a rounder birth canal. We are not yet seeing an increase in the absolute diameters of the birth canal. We are seeing an upward rotation of the pubis. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the parts that we need in order to tell whether we've got the downward rotation of the ischium, so that remains an open question. Um, with respect to the secondary changes, we are not seeing a reduction in the length of the superior pubic ramus. It's still very Australopith-like and very long, but we are seeing more vertical and less laterally flared iliac blades. Um, we are seeing sort of what appears to be a more robust iliac pillar in one specimen, but not the other, so that's variable. So again, we don't know what to make of that. We are definitely seeing greater robusticity of the ilium, and we are seeing this reduced distance from the acetabulum to the ischial tuberosity. So to me, it really seems like the obstetric model seems to be problematic. We're seeing a lot of these changes which are argued to be the function of brain size expansion and the need to enlarge the birth canal in a species which has got a small adult brain size. Um, now, does that mean that the arboreal model is correct? It doesn't de facto mean that the arboreal model is right. It simply means that there's, that there's a problem with this obstetric um, explanation for the differences between Australopithecus and Homo. However, to my way of thinking, it's sort of hard to, to imagine why we're seeing these changes in the pelvis if it doesn't reflect a, some sort of change in the way that the pelvis is bearing loads and operating during locomotion. To me, it suggests that there is some sort of kinematic shift going on. Thank you. <laughs>